Our scripture lessons today, a reading from Isaiah and Acts. Isaiah 43 verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, <clears throat> and my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. <clears throat> and Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to read a few more verses out of Isaiah 43 because I think that portion is powerful. In fact, if you have time, read chapter 43 all the way to chapter 46. Those are some powerful chapters as God reveals His sovereignty, as God speaks very personally about a relationship that He would like with us and ultimately through us. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, says the Lord. I am God, and also henceforth I am He. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can hinder it? Wow! What a powerful passage of Scripture that is, as God reveals Himself in a very personal and understandable way through the prophet Isaiah. Remember, this is the Isaiah who, when he caught a real glimpse of God, understood that he fell far short of God's purpose. I'm a man of unclean lips, was his assessment of himself. When he saw God high and lifted up, he realized how inadequate he was, how unworthy he was, how sinful he was. And it was God who said, I know how to remedy that. A coal from the altar touched his lips and he was purified, forgiven, made whole. And it wasn't long after that God said, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah was able to volunteer, to say, here am I. And God said, go. And now, in chapter 43, God is revealing himself in a beautiful way. I, I am God. There is no other. There never was and there never will be. And guess what? I want you to be my witness. I want you to be my servant. I hope you can hear that loud and clear this morning. That God is looking for a deeply personal, intimate relationship with you and me. That He wants to start there. He wants to reveal Himself to us. Yes, we can walk outside and we can look up at the stars and say, Wow, it's vast, it's awesome. There must be somebody out there that made all of this. If we study the workings of space and the order of it all, yeah, there must be somebody who designed it. As we'll witness leaves appearing on seemingly dead trees and flowers popping out of the ground, we will say, somebody had to create all of this. But that somebody would be distant and unknowable. Unless he showed up close and personal and said, I, I am God. I am the one who made you. There is no other. And I want you to belong to me. I want you to be my witness. And so I want us to start there this morning. What is God asking for? Well, I think the first thing He's asking for is that we acknowledge that He is God. Those who come to God must believe that He is. No one can force that on you. You are a free moral agent. You can say, mm, doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to do it. 
and God will let you act like a fool. The fool says in his heart there is no God, and we can be the fool and live like God doesn't exist. It's our prerogative. Or we can look and say, wow, there must be a creator out there. There must be a designer. I wonder who he is. And when we get to that place, we can take the faith God has given us and put it in the living God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who come to him must believe that he is, and he will reward us if we diligently seek him. That is your opportunity. That is mine. That is our invitation from the living God. He wants us to know him. He's not playing hide and seek. He is the creator. He is the one who longs for you and me to find him as Abba. The one who has loved us long before we were even created. From the foundation of the earth, he knew about you and me. He planned our existence. All our days planned before we even lived one of them. He knows you intimately. He longs for you and me to know him intimately. He calls us to be his, to be his witnesses, to witness to his sovereignty, to witness to his love, his redeeming grace, to know him deeply and personally, to fall madly in love with him the way he loves us, as we connect to God, we discover a love that is truly amazing, that sees beyond all of our sin, all of our weakness, all of our questions, all of our struggles. A God who loves us just the way we are, and yet is committed to us to grow us into all that we can be. Ephesians 2 verse 10, He will make a masterpiece out of you. He's got plans and purposes that you and I don't even know about, but he knows. He prepared them beforehand for you and me to live into them, to grow into that beautiful image of God that will bear witness to him. But it starts with you and me acknowledging him, wanting him, choosing him, confessing our sins and making him a part of our lives. We've got to join Isaiah and say, woe is me. I'm a sinful man. And when we start there, God can take a coal and purify your life and mine. He can heal us and welcome us into a relationship. Christ came to open up a new and living way for everyone who turns to him, who calls on his name, who wants to be a part of the family. God takes no pleasure in the death of a sinner. God takes great joy in every sinner coming home. All of heaven erupts with applause and joy when we find our way back into relationship with God. He wants that. He longs for that. He delights in that. In Acts 1 verse 8, he says, I want you to be witnesses. I will fill you with my spirit and you will go in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even to the farthest reaches of this planet and you will tell others about me. But it starts with you and me having a deeply personal relationship with him. I want to talk about a few people that experienced this very thing. I had the privilege of serving up at the Oklahoma State Senate again this week. The opening session, the lieutenant governor always shows up. He's officially the president of the Senate, but he's so busy he's seldom there. But on the first opening session, he's always there. Todd Lamb was there, and we visited, and I asked him this time, tell me, how did you come to know God? And he said, I grew up in the Baptist church. And I saw people walk up front and speak to one of the guys up there, and then it would be pretty much the next week, they'd be up in the baptismal font, boom, and they'd go down. And I watched this happen week after week, year after year, and finally when I was just a young boy, six or seven, I said, I want to go up, and he did. And they visited with him and they told him about confessing your sins and believing in Jesus. And he said, I do. And they said, well, we're ready to baptize you then. And he said, the very next week, there I was. Boom, and they baptized me. He said, but it didn't really come alive in me. It was years later, there was a revival speaker and I went with a group. And in that service, God spoke to me, touched my heart. 
And I responded again and I went forward and I gave my life to Christ. And ever since then, my life has been committed to following him. This is what we're talking about, a personal encounter with God. Paul had it when he was hell-bent on killing every Christian that he could find. He was fully convinced that he was right, like many of us are, whatever our position is. And in this case, he believed that Judaism, the way he had been taught and raised in it, was, was what was right. And what Jesus taught and those who followed Jesus were heretics. They were wrong. And so he rounded them up and he imprisoned them and he delighted in seeing them stomped off the face of the earth until he found Jesus in a personal way. You know the story. On his way to round up some more, on his way to imprison some more, and finally Jesus shows up one-on-one -on -one with him and he says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go, and I will tell you what you must do. And like a blind man, for three days, he's led into Damascus, and he waits. And another Christian comes and prays for him, and scales fall from his eyes, and he can see again, and he's baptized. And it doesn't take him long to start looking at the scriptures and studying, and he goes to the synagogue, and he starts telling people, wow, let me tell you what God did for me. I was opposed to Jesus. I was persecuting Jesus. But he loved me nevertheless. And he showed up and he saved me. And he's taught me that he really is the Lord. There is no other God. He is the Son of God in the flesh. So effective is Paul's witness that people start resenting him in Damascus. In fact, they start making plans to kill him. They've got to lower him down in a basket down the wall and he's got to run for his life. He becomes that very witness that Isaiah spoke of. He becomes that witness that Jesus said each of us who knows him would become. He does something in our lives, something wonderful, and all of a sudden we can't help but tell others about it. This is what Jesus says. He says, if you confess me to others, I'll confess you before the Father and his angels. But if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and His angels. When something real has happened in us, there's a joy, there's a wonder, there's a purposefulness about the sharing. Paul will go so far as to say, I'm compelled, like a sail with wind blowing that sail and moving it in God's direction. So we become instruments for God to share the good news with others. One more story. The demoniac at Gadara, they tried to tie him up with ropes. They tried to tie him up with chains. He would break them. He was a madman. He lived among the tombs. Nobody wanted to be with him until Jesus showed up and delivered him from all those demons. There were so many that he said they were legion. You know the story? They entered the pigs and they ran off and drowned themselves. And the people showed up from the town. They said, what's going on here? They saw that demoniac in his right mind, clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And all the pigs drowned. And they were so disturbed, they asked Jesus to leave. And he did. And that demoniac came and said, Jesus, can't I just join the group and go with you? And he said, no. I want you to go back and tell others what God has done for you. You see, the demoniac discovered that there is a God, the true and living God. And through the words of Christ, his demon possession ended and his sanity returned. And he had a whole new life, a whole new purpose. In fact, historically, we believe he changed that Gentile area by his witness. It was a dark area where there was little faith, but this demon-possessed man, newly delivered, newly received by God, went and shared the good news that there is a God. And he met him through Christ. And through his witness, others came to know Christ and God as well. I remember now almost 40 years ago, my mother getting really concerned about me because I was starting to drink underage. I was starting to lie and cheat. I was starting to act in ways that I knew were wrong and she knew were wrong. And I've told you the story. As a faithful guide, she put a big old Bible next to my bed, first time ever. 
son, please read the Bible. But as teenagers who are living the riotous life, we've got little desire or time to read the Bible. And so it stood there day after day, but I really didn't want to read it. In fact, when I opened it up a time or two, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. And then mom was the one who said, why don't we go to worship? Why don't we go to church together again and again? And I said, no, thanks. I've got plans with my friends. I've got surfing to do. I was not interested in church, but she kept going until finally one day I had to say, mom, please stop it. I'm not breaking the law by staying away from church. You make me feel guilty. And she said, okay, son, I won't ask you anymore. And I said, thank God. I was just sick of it. You know how sinners can be when God's trying to lead you down the right road and you're just sick of God's grace and love? That's how I was. But a, a mother's prayers continued faithfully. And others prayed. And through those prayers and through the wonderful prevenient grace of God, my heart was touched. And I showed up in church with friends and the message of the gospel touched my life. And I remember so clearly getting up from the back row and walking down and kneeling at the chancel rail and saying a simple prayer, Jesus, if you will have me, I'll try to be true to you. And Jesus took that prayer and he forgave me my sins just like he forgave the demoniac, just like he forgave Isaiah, just like he'll forgive you. If you and I are sincere and we want to know him, he waits for that opportunity. I felt a weight lifted. The next day, a journey began with Christ that I had no imagination would begin. Little would I have thought that he would call me to be a pastor. I had no inkling or desire to be here in these United States of America, but here I am, a part of his purpose. He wants you to be his witness. He wants me to be his witness. He wants you to be a graceful guide to help others. A mother who puts a Bible next to her son's bed. A mother who prays for her son. A mother who says, come and worship with me. And again and again, I deny that request. But she keeps asking. Isn't that just like our God? No thanks, not interested, got better things to do. But he doesn't give up. You see, he loves us. He wants us. He longs for us. Like the prodigal, he looks for us every day. Maybe today my boy will come home. Maybe my daughter will come home. And church, I challenge you this morning. Are you prepared to become one of those graceful guides for God? Will you let him touch you and change you and fill you with his spirit? Will you hear his challenge? Be my witness. Tell others about me. You don't have to become a, a Bible thumper. But you do have to speak up. You do have to invite. You do have to pray. You've got to become intentional. There are a lot of people out in the world today that are very proud of what they're doing. And a lot of it is not to be proud of. But they're coming right out and letting everybody know who they are and what they are. And I challenge you today. Will you come out and let people know who Christ is and what he's done for you? Like that demoniac who couldn't wait to tell others that. I was possessed, but Jesus delivered me. I was lost and, and somebody that others couldn't even be around. And look at me today. I'm in my sane mind. I'm a new man. My brother Mike likes to say it this way. He says, I look for an opportunity to brag on Jesus. Would you join him and look for an opportunity to, to brag on Jesus, to commend him to others, to pray for others? It's the very heart of God that you know him and that in the knowing you will share him with others. In your own voice, in your own home, in your own circle of influence. God placed you there for a purpose. There are no mere mortals and your life is not inconsequential. He has plans and purposes for you. Before the foundation of the earth, he knew you'd be created and he knew he had a plan that you could fulfill. But he won't force you. He invites you. Be my witness. Be my servant. Walk tall. Realize that you belong to God not just now, but for eternity. And it's going to be a sad day if we show up there and there are people missing because we were lousy witnesses, because we were afraid, because we didn't want to offend, because we were too busy. 
May He be our first love. May He be the joy that we gladly share with another. When we meet somebody who's going through difficulty, be the first person to say, let me pray for you and do it. If they're new to the community and they don't have a church home, be the first person to say, hey, I belong to a great church family. Come and join us. See if we're a good fit. If somebody needs help, be the first person to say, how can I help? Maybe I can give you a ride. Maybe I can help you in a marriage that's going south. Be God's witness. Remember, you are filled with God's Spirit. You are a wonderful resource. You and Jesus make miracles if you want them. And He wants them. Be a grace-filled guide. Tell others what He's done for you. Hear Jesus as He says to the demoniac, No, you don't have to join us in the boat and go across the lake. You can stay right here and tell others who God is and what He's done for you. And He did. And He changed His community. And you can too. Become His grace-filled guide. Lord, we bow before You this morning acknowledging our own brokenness. With that tax collector, we beat on our chest and say, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. With Isaiah, we say, I'm a man of unclean lips. I need help. Please forgive me, restore me. With Paul, we say, Lord, we're often deluded, persuaded about how right we are and often heading in the wrong direction. Stop us in our tracks. Turn us around. Help us to see the light. Help us to become the light in a dark world. Make us quick to share you with others, to, to commend you to others. We offer you our lives. Thankful that you want us to be your witnesses. Help us to speak up, to stand up, to share you with others every chance we get. We pray it this morning in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. And all God's children said, Amen. If you'll remain seated for just a moment and take the little black hymnal out of your pew, The Faith We Sing, turn to hymn number 2236, a beautiful hymn our pastor has selected for our closing. And I'm going to have the choir sing through it one time for you, and then you can join with us. But if you'll follow along on 2236, gather us in, and then we'll stand in just a minute, and you can join with us.
couple of challenges this morning. If you don't know Christ, if you don't have assurance this morning that your life is right with God, then please don't leave before visiting with one of us that we can pray with you, birth you into the kingdom. Let that altar become a place of transformation for you this morning. And if you do know Christ, but you've kind of meandered along, careless, maybe that fire has burnt out in your life. Make sure that you're in love with Jesus by the time you leave. Make sure that he knows that he's your first priority today and every day from today. If your marriage is in difficulty and you're struggling and you need brothers and sisters to gather around you and pray for you and maybe even counsel down the road, please come. We are here for that purpose. We want you to have a strong, happy marriage. If your kids are wayward and going down the wrong road like I was, and you want people to pray for them, please, the altar is open for you this morning to pray before you leave. Please make sure that any unfinished business with God is taken care of this morning before you leave. Receive God's blessing as we dismiss. O oh great I am, the I am who appeared to Abraham, the I am who appeared to Moses, the I am who appeared to Isaiah and Paul and the demoniac, become the great I am to us. Help us to know you and love you and be your faithful witnesses. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen.